control over us. Whatever we try to control does have control over us in our life. I have given this control to so many things and people in my life. I have never gotten the results I wanted from controlling or trying to control people. What I received from my efforts is, a, is an unmanageable lifestyle, whether that unmanageability was inside me or in external events. In recovery, we have a trade-off. We trade a life that we have tried to control, we receive in return something better, a life that is manageable. They'll exchange a controlled life for one that is manageable. I want to share that with you because we're going to be talking tonight about caretaking addictions. And I want to bring the fact that all the addictions I've talked about over the past weeks are all fundamentally an illusion of control. Because I think that gets so many of us in trouble, myself included, is when we try to control situations, we try to control people, and we try to make things be that we want them to be. And as a result, then we end up with our own unmanageability. So I want to cover two, two major areas tonight. I want to talk about caretaking versus service. Two different words. Caretaking, I want to talk about the caretaking addictions, which are primarily workaholism, drugs and alcohol, also relationship addictions, and also under this comes compulsive overeating. These caretaking addictions really go back to the foundations, as we say in our childhood. These are normally growing up, these are what I call the goody two-shoes kids, the nice guys and gals. These are the kids who at a very early age are given a tremendous amount of responsibility. And as a result, they have to grow up too fast. And as a result, very many times they don't realize it, but they build a lot of frustration, a lot of resentment, a lot of anger inside of them. And that anger then leads them to be able to, that leads them to the fact that they have a low self-esteem. That anger also leads them to try to control situations and things around them. And also it tries, they get very much caught up in blaming and being critical about a lot of things. And so very many times when I have to constantly, constantly have answers to everything and caretakers and also so many codependents, we have answers to things we don't even know what the questions are. It's totally amazing. We do stuff backwards. And so we come right down to it. And what I want to look at tonight is look at these addictions through these eyes, which is so important. For example, we look at work. Caretakers are very good at performing. They're very good at getting things done. I'll give you a good example of this. When I was ordained a priest, in 1966, I went to my first parish, which was in Vineland, New Jersey. Now, you got to remember, I was overprotected as a child. I was in protective custody in the seminary for 12, 12 years. I had no idea at all what the hell was going on out in the world. I was naive as hell. I walked into a parish where the pastor was a very sick alcoholic. I walked into insanity. And right from that first day, that Saturday when I walked in, I was told that I would have to be in charge of almost everything. And so my first day on the job, the caretaker, was to set up 250 chairs in a hall because we had no church, set up the altars, introduce myself to the parish, and then for the next three years, run the place. I had no idea how to run a place, but because... I have a lot of good control issues. I was able to do it. And so as a result, then I literally went totally out of control, trying to do everything for everybody. At the same time, I became very critical, very angry, very resentful, and very blaming. See, I blamed him for everything. And the crazy part about it was I could not look within my own eye. I looked at everything else around me. And so as a result, then I realized over and over again that it took time for me to come to my own awakening because I got good at performing. I got good at being in charge of everything. I got good at running everything, but I was also very lonely because literally everything was centralized around 
me making sure everything worked the way it was supposed to work. What's scary about that is you really are trying to manipulate and control people around you. That can create a lot of crazy problems in your life. I look at it in my own life today and I still, I, I kind of joke about it, but I, I don't like to joke about it because it was real. I went to my first 12 step meeting in 1969, it was Al-Anon, and even then, Morgan, who took me to the meeting, and I thank him for that. I walked into the al meeting, and I decided to control the al meeting. What the hell? Might as well. I controlled everything else. Because of those people at al kept telling me to work on me, and I didn't need any work. See, I came there, so they would give me the formula to fix him. He needed to work. So come on, people, give me the damn formula. They never did. They kept telling me to work on me, and I thought they were strange human beings. It's amazing when you come right down to it. And I share this with you because so many codependents and so many of us move into caretaking, and caretaking basically can drain you dry, and yet at the same time, you can so easily become victims and create victims at the same time. Because we, when it comes to work, when it comes to jobs, very many times we have a tendency to want to be in charge of the whole thing. But then we're going to bitch and gripe about everybody else about us. At the same time, I don't want anybody else to do it but me. We even see this in our recovery world a lot of times. We have individuals who think they, they want to run the whole program. But really what they're doing is avoiding looking at themselves. And I understand this today because I realize that caretaking addictions are ways in which we avoid having to look at ourselves on the inside. Having to go to our core center who we really are as a person. So it's much easier to look at somebody else and blame somebody else, and be critical of somebody else than it is to look at your own personal self. And I'm grateful today to have turned the corner on that. But I realize over and over again, these caretaking addictions bring us into that. And that's why caretakers have a hard time even asking for what they're worth. Caretakers have a hard time, but they want to do everything, be in charge of everything. See, I've learned something in my life. I go back to a basic premise I had. And I, this is one of my jokes. I joke about things. When I got ordained, I decided by myself I would save the whole entire world. I didn't need any help, by the way. That got me an addiction and a nervous breakdown. When I left the hospital, I decided just to save the United States. That got me another addiction. And eventually I got to the point where I figured I'd just save New Jersey because it needs it, I know. So I finally got to a point where I finally had to look at me and deal with me. What I didn't realize with these addictions, all of them, that there was so much unresolved stuff inside of me that I was too busy looking at everything else around me. And that's the scary part about it. It's the same thing when it comes to relationships. We have a tendency in relationships to want to be with somebody we can be in charge of. We call this the parent-child relationship. That's why so many times we migrate towards people, towards sickies, and want to take care of them all the time. But we don't really want them to get well because then we can gripe and complain and carry on. And literally, literally, we always have somebody to blame. And as a result, then, the bottom line is, if they really did get better and they really did move forward, we would not handle it. See, it's almost like I crave being a victim and creating victims. That's where I get into the caretaking thing, because I really believe very many times that so many times we have a tendency to become caretakers and want to do everything for everybody else. But the bottom line is, we can't do anything for ourselves. I always kind of talk about the thing, I, I saw this in the, in the codependency book, but a, a lady standing, old lady standing on a street corner, this guy walks up to her and says, I'll help you across the street. He grabs her arm and she was re resisting him all the way across the street. And he got to the other side and she actually took her umbrella and smacked him over the head with it. And then he sat there, why are you upsetting me? I just helped you. I got you across the street. She said, I didn't want to cross the street. I was just standing there looking at things. See, the bottom line is we play that game. I did it. Many of us did it. 
you know, I'm going to fix you whether you want to get fixed or not. So as a result, then I'm going to literally, literally make you become what I want you to become. Uh, we need some beautiful lessons in humility when it comes to this. Because in relationships, so many times, they have a tendency to get in negative relationships and then gripe about them, but we stay in them. Because somehow this time I'm going to fix it. The battered woman syndrome, we see this a lot of times in. People going back to the same thing, think it'll be better the next time. All these things come into play as part of this process. The thing we have to learn is the gift of humility. You know, earlier tonight at my 12-step meeting, we were, were working on the traditions. And we did tradition 11 and 12. We talked about principles and personalities. We talked about the importance not of getting into judgments but to realize the importance of living by the principles and the principles of life, which are so important. And what I learned so much from that is in my own journey, in my own life, how important it is to go back to the basics, the fundamentals and the principles. But like you, like me, like so many of us, I got to do it the hard way first and get a callus on my head. And then finally begin to slow down and begin to realize I don't want to get caught up in this anymore. That's where drugs and alcohol come into play. Because so many caretakers have a tendency to migrate towards drugs and alcohol, but we're the goody two-shoes. So we use legal addiction. The alcohol, we go to the, we get the proper prescriptions. We abuse them a little bit here and there, take the edge off, do this kind of thing. But God forbid, we'll never go to Camden or never get in trouble or do all those kinds of things. But the bottom line is you have a tendency to use addictions to literally take the edge off of us so that we can be in control even more. Now, I'm learning over and over and over again that illusion, that powerful illusion of control. And God, I'm learning over and over again how we have to learn to let go. Those first three steps of the program are so powerful in helping us to do this. The same with compulsive overeating. I never understood this until I got into recovery, that my compulsive overeating fundamentally, and for all, many of us as compulsive overeaters, was repressed anger, frustration, and resentment. I held inside of me for a long period of time. And the amazing part about it was I didn't even know it. So I'll tell you a little story. When I was in the hospital with a nervous breakdown quite a number of years ago, I met a doctor in that hospital. And that doctor said something to me, which took me a long time to finally understand. He said, Vince, I hate to tell you this, he said, but you're a pretty sick person. You have no idea who you are. You have no sense of yourself at all. He said to me, you're spiritually dead. And by that he meant there's nothing on the inside of you at all. And he said, you've got to take some time to find out who you are. And again, I looked at him. I couldn't understand. I was a priest. How could I be spiritually dead? But he said, yeah, Vince, you function externally. You function on the outside. But you have no internal sense, no spirit, no sense of real faith, no sense of real belief. And I couldn't understand that because I knew all the stuff intellectually. And as a result, then I totally never truly understood what he was talking about until even though I got in the recovery after I left the hospital, I became one of those world famous two steppers where I did the first step and the 12th step, skipped the 10 in between, and went out to save the world whether you want to get saved or not. As a result, I became a mark. I often say caretakers have that target on their, on their back and people can see them coming. We get taken advantage of, and by the way, we gripe about it, but we like it because we get paid attention to. And so the same concept happens over and over and over again. I never understood also with compulsive overeating how I was putting a wall around me, not to have to feel and deal with my feelings, but above all, to put a wall around me I wouldn't have to get involved in my sexuality, anything to that effect. It was a way to avoid, to hide, not have to do the stuff or deal with stuff that, you know, was sensitive and, and deal with feelings. And that's why at one time I was over 300 pounds 
and my life was out of control and totally unmanageable. And I'm grateful today. I'm so grateful to the people, the individuals that were able to finally break that wall, penetrate that wall, and get me to begin to open up the door, to begin the journey of getting connected to find out who I am. And the thing I finally have gotten through my own thick head, not got an Italian thick head, believe me, I got through my own thick head after a number of years, was a tremendous gift that was given to us by the founders of AA, the 12 steps. But notice their wisdom. And here's the part so many of us have a hard time with, and that's where I wanna talk a little bit about service in a couple of minutes, because caretaking can be extremely, extremely negative. Because caretaking means I'm gonna, I can push others and try to take care of them. But service is something totally different. Another word for what I call healthy caretaking. And service means that I carry a message, I reach out, but for example, with that lady wanting to cross the street, I walk up to her and say, do you, do you need help crossing the street? If she says no, then you leave her alone. You don't decide for her and make decisions for her. And so many times we get caught up in that process with it. And so it's the exact same thing I've learned in the 12 steps and how they're set up. You notice what they say. The founders gave us 11 steps, 11 steps for us to work just on ourselves, nobody else. They also told us that having had a spiritual awakening, having done your own personal work, then you carry a message. You carry a message by the way you live your life. You, you carry a message in simple and beautiful ways. You carry a message by simply planting some seeds. And practice these principles in all your affairs and every aspect of your life. I want to share a story with you which helped me tremendously in my growth process. And I look back on so many people today. I can remember when I was trained to become a therapist. It's one of the reasons why I share the same stuff with many of the interns and new people coming up in therapy. When I was trained to become a therapist, I did my therapy training at DRC in Philadelphia, Diagnostic Rehabilitation Center, which is a rehab for street people. And I had a very spiritual and wonderful mentor named Jack R. And Jack was a very beautiful and spiritual man. And when I got there, I asked him because I was all psyched up because I had all this thera uh, therapy stuff I had learned in class. And I was ready to go to work on people with it. And he sent me downstairs to the men's quarters and told me when men come in, I want you to help give them baths, to louse them and get them cleaned up and get them ready for treatment. He said to me, Vince, it don't smell too good down there, but it's a smell I want you to remember for the rest of your life. And as you see those men come through that door, always say, but for the grace of God, but for the grace of God. That was the most humbling jobs I ever had in my whole entire life. And yet I am so grateful for it today. I, and believe it or not, I still remember that smell. I didn't forget it. And it taught me so many beautiful things about the journey of life. It taught me what real life really is all about. And I realized the fact that people that came through those doors were from all different parts of life. Some of my classmates came through those doors. It's scary. With this disease, this insanity, this craziness can do to you. And that's why I, don't I try not to take anything for granted today. I realize I can only do what I can do. I try to stay within my own reality. But I learned also from the good old timers in AA, they say, carry the message, not the drunk. Carry the message, not the person. We don't really help somebody by enabling them or by constantly doing it for them or constantly rescuing them and saving them. I finally got this to my, I can't save anybody. All I can do is carry a message and work on myself. I hate to tell you this, 
But to work on yourself is a full-time job. And that means you leave everybody else alone, okay? Take a break. You can share with them. You can plant seeds. But you can't fix them. You can't rescue them. You can't. You got to give them their due. Let them find their own way. You can help them along the way. It's an old story about I can give a man a fish or I can teach him how to fish. Service work is teaching them how to fish. Over caretaking is giving them something, which means I'm making them more dependent on me. And that's the scary thing about caretaking because I can very easily make everybody dependent on me. And as a result, then literally my life becomes unmanageable and their life still stays unmanageable as a result of it. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Some of my greatest teachers I've had on my journey were people that taught me simplicity, taught me the little things of life. Those people who want to confront me and open doors up for me and get me started on the journey. I have a lot of gratitude today, but I also know something else today. All I can do is share the things that work for me. All I can do is be open to new things and from new people and people around me. Because people that come through the doors are my teachers every day. And that's why I love the traditions of the program because of unity, humility. We're all connected together. Nobody's any better than anybody else. We all have our little idiosyncrasies. We have our little ways in which we do things. We all have our imperfections. Isn't that wonderful? God, it's fantastic. And that's where that principles versus personalities comes into play. It's not about judging anybody else. We're all different. Thank God. We have to learn the principles, the foundations. And I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. My first sponsor in OA, Richard, beautiful man. And basically he's been around the rooms for a long time in other programs too. But he told me a story. He said when he first got into AA recovery, he said he was walking down the street, coming just getting out of a rehab, walking down the street. And he passed the bar. And a guy came out of the bar, and when Richard saw him, he got nervous, was he was freshly in recovery, so I walked him real fast to get away from the guy. Got to the meeting, sat down, and they introduced the speaker for the meeting. It was the guy who walked out of the bar. He's up there telling us not to drink, to live a good sober lifestyle, the whole bit, the whole works. So afterwards, he went and called the sponsor, and he says, AA is a bunch of hypocrites. I saw that man come out of a bar. He was up there and he said, don't drink. The sponsor said, good advice, follow it. Principles, not personal. None of your damn business whether he was drinking or not. There's nothing to do with you. He's carrying a message. The message is don't drink. Good message, follow it. I, and that story always taught me so many things about the process of recovery. Because I realize more and more now, it's the little things that make the things that are so important. It's being able to realize that teachers are the people we meet in the course of our journey every day. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. Promise me you don't tell anybody, okay? Please. Carol, I know you, you have to keep the secret. Anyway, one of the things I want to bring up is the world we live in, last time I checked, is very dysfunctional. It's very crazy. And somebody told me this. It's been that way since the beginning of time. It will be that way till the end of time. Now, I have to live in that world. I have to learn from that dysfunctionality. I have to grow from it. So dysfunctionality is part of life. I don't see it as a bad word. I see it as something that will help me to become a better person if I'm able to embrace it, learn from it, grow from it, let it become my teacher. Everything in life has a purpose. It has a journey. It will find its way. You never know where it's going to go, but it's the little things that make life what they are, the simple things that make life what they are. And I've learned this over and over again. It could be that one little person that comes and spends time with you. It could be you spending time with another person. It can be you just honoring and respecting the people around you. But we have to be able to go within and look at ourselves. And I've learned these principles. 
If I learn finally, slowly but surely how to love me, then I can love somebody else and give the gift to somebody else. If I learn to honor and respect who I am, then I can share that with others. If I learn to take care of myself, then I can become an example for others. It's all by example, by the way you live your life, by the simple little things of life. That's what life is really all about, not the big things. And that's what we have to understand as human beings that we're on this earth. We all have different talents, different gifts. Each one of us is part of the mosaic. Each one is interconnected with each other. And we learn from each in person's gift, gifts in this life. So we're all different, thank God. I don't want all of us to be the same, we'll be crazy. The bottom line is it's great to realize the fact that we're going to go through turmoil. We're going to go through grief. We're going to go through change. We're going to go through different things in our life. We're going to go through loss. We're going to go through wonderment. We're going to wonder why things happen the way they happen. We're going to go through fear and anxiety. All these things are part of the journey. They're part of life. But I know one thing I've learned. I don't want to do it anymore by myself. Oh, I need support. I need help. I need people. I need a sense of family. And I've learned over and over again, my recovery family is still my greatest family. It's my connection. Because I can feel safe there. I can get loved unconditionally. I can be open to new things. And caretakers have to learn. We have to learn to stop, stop trying to take care of everybody else. And learn the gift of the word service. See, service is so spiritual, it's unbelievable. Service is the way in which I take the gift of myself and I just plant seeds for somebody else. You never know where it's going to be, what's going to happen. Now, I got to tell you a story. It's always a story. You know that. But yesterday, I had cataract surgery in my left eye. And I had the experience of going through, through the surgery. It was a great surgery. The doctor was fantastic. It really was. The whole place was fantastic that I was at. But the nurse in the operating room, because they don't put you out, they can just put you under a little bit, you actually can hear everything. The doctor talks to you during the surgery. And it was really quite an experience. I'm grateful for it today. But after the, the nurse that was helping the doctor, after it was over, came into the um, recovery room when I was there, and she said, I, I just came to visit you for a minute, Vince, to see if you're okay. But I also want to say thank you. I says, thank you for what? She said, well, you don't know it, but my son met you seven years ago in rehab and everything you helped him with, he's in recovery now for seven years. I wanna say thank you. Thank you for being a good influence in his life. I said, I, I said, I, I said okay. She, you know, she gave me an elbow hug. You know, we do the elbow hugs, you know, and basically it was, it was kind of neat. You know, and uh, another one of my South Philadelphia contingent. But the bottom line was, you know, I still don't know who she is. She said, but I'm on Facebook, so I'll message you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, good. Do that. You know, but see, you don't, you don't know how things happen. You don't need to know. See, it's not about, you know, going out and conquering the world or doing this or doing that. I can look at things negatively. I can look at them positively. So service work is when I just live my life, plant a seed, help somebody here, help somebody there, a little thing in this direction, something in that direction. I don't know. You never know how you're going to touch another human being. My interns, when they start, they're getting ready to get their master's degree. They're getting ready to become therapists, you know, and they are all excited. And I tell them, well, enjoy your book learning because now, here comes the real learning. The people that come through that door, they are your new teachers. They are the ones who are going to teach you through experience what life really is all about. And it's the little things that you say, even just the gift of listening, of being available, of being there. Remember I told you before in the reading I did in one of the meditation books, uh, God gave us one mouth and two ears, which means we're supposed to listen more than we're supposed to talk. And I've learned over the journey of my life, some of my greatest teachers are people that didn't say a lot, but they spoke by the way they lived their lives, the little things of life. 
I remember my first sponsor way back in 1976, and he took me to the mustard seed meeting in Philadelphia. And he lectured me about the little mustard seed. And he said, this mustard seed is you, Vince. And if you let it grow and give it time and have patience and try not to do too much, over time, it's going to grow. And it's going to become this beautiful, beautiful tree. It's not, it's not a pretty tree. It's kind of ugly. But it's also a human tree. And all your gifts will blossom. Things will come out. But you have to have faith. You have to believe. You have to stay away from the negative. You know, and I truly believe with faith and the gift of faith, everything finds its way. If things are supposed to be, they'll be. If they're not supposed to be, then they won't be. It's all simple stuff. But you know what? They said this so many times. It is a simple program for complicated people. We are so damn complicated, it's unbelievable. Want to know why? I told you, when I die, if I get to meet God, the first thing I want to say to God is this. I want to tell God he made a mistake. Here's my control issues again. Well, you should have put an on-off on, switch up here in my head so I could shut the sucker off and break it so it would stay off. Because I'm convinced this thing gets me in so much trouble. If I just keep it simple, if I enjoy the little things around me, the people around me, the little gifts of life, the things that you connect with, great teachers are right out there. I mean, I know we live in a world that gets complicated sometimes. I guess because we're supposed to, because we, I, I think I checked it. We're all a bunch of human beings out there. We're all going through our stuff. And yes, we get scared, we get afraid, and we go through changes. But somehow, somehow with faith and with growth, things always find their way and they come through. So I guess what I'm saying tonight when it comes to caretaking, how about if we move to the, the art of service rather than caretaking? Rather than trying to fix someone or save someone, work within your own self. Because I really believe that deep down inside, we, we become the victim ourselves because we keep so much garbage buried inside of us. And I'm going to be honest with you, I never knew how much garbage I had because I spent a lot of years blaming institutions, blaming the government, blaming all kinds of stuff for my life the way it was. And my therapist, a wise man, I thank God for him every day, used to say to me every week, it's your issue, Vince, not the churches, not this place, it's you. You have the power, make the decisions, work on you, take care of you, and whatever things happens around you, let them happen. Learn from them and grow from them. Failure is part of life. It makes you a stronger person. Endings are part of life. There's a beginning and there's an ending as part of life. It's all part of the process. Now, my my father used to say it all the time. He used to say, you come into the world in diapers, you go out in diapers. Diapers are part of the journey. They clean up you need to know what inside of us. But it's all part of the journey we're on in life. So learn three words to help us break the caretaking habit. Live your own life. Live it to the fullest. Laugh at yourself at least once a day. Because we all do crazy stuff. Congratulations, you know, and love above all. The greatest simple little gift we can give to another human being is the act of love, the act of understanding, the act of patience, the act of endurance sometimes, the act of being open. All these little things make so much in life because basically, what destroys us, what caretaking is, it can be very lonely. I don't know about you, I got tired of living in a telephone booth. You know, waiting for somebody to call so I could run out to the rescue. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be able to live in my own, in my own body and my own self and enjoy the simplicity and the beauty of life around me. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful to all the little people that we're connected to in the course of our journey. And that's what's important. And we're connected to each other. 
we're all part of the family. We're all connected together. So let's all be good to one another. And let's not try to save one another. But let's try to support one another and be able to do service in the little things we can share with others in the course of our journey in life. And so we look at this today and I want to say a prayer to help us just to realize the importance of being open to new things and new directions in the course of our journey in life. Because let's face it, we're all God's children in one way or another. Let us pray. God, we come before you today in prayer. We ask for your guidance, for your direction. Please, please, please help us to realize that you're in charge, not us. Teach us not to be able to take your job on this earth. Teach us to realize in the humble spirit there were people learning, struggling, going through the journey of life every day. Be with us in our struggle, be with us in our pain, be with us in our joy, be with us in every aspect of our life. But teach us deep down inside just to have a sense of faith, a sense of belief. Teach us to let go and realize all we can do is take the gift you've given us and just touch and share it with others. You have given us the greatest gift of all, the gift of your love. You have asked us to go out and be ambassadors of your gift. So wherever you meet, wherever we connect, help us not to be judgmental. Help us just to be open to the people around us to learn, to grow from the experiences of life. Teach us not to live in fear, although fear will come along, but teach us to realize we can't control life. We must be open to it, learn from it, and grow from it. And above all, thank you for all the teachers that you sent into our life. All those people have touched us in one way or another, for they truly, truly are the people that gave us the gift the gift of their love. And we now pass that gift on to others. We pray and ask for your guidance, for your direction. And above all, we pray that we'll be able to let go and let you be in charge and be open to your will. We pray and we ask this every day in your name. Amen. Now we're going to ask you all to unmute yourself. We're going to close by doing the serenity prayer. And we'll do the we version of the serenity prayer. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God's will, not mine, be done.